Hi, I'm Zach Hayden, the Soil and Nutrient Management Specialist for Vegetable Crops at Michigan State University. In this video, I'm going to give you an update on our asparagus nitrogen management research. This is a project we've been working on for three years now in collaboration with Omen Brothers Farm and with funding support from Michigan Asparagus, MDARD, and the USDA. Asparagus production systems have changed a lot over the past few decades, with new higher yielding varieties, increased fresh market production, and expanded use of overhead irrigation, there's been greater interest in more intensive fertility management programs for asparagus. In particular, many growers have wondered if higher rates of nitrogen fertilizer, as well as split applications during fern growth, may be necessary to optimize yield and quality for modern production systems, particularly on West Michigan's sandy soils. So, in 2017, we started an on-farm experiment and established three-year-old stand of millennium under center pivot irrigation. Each year, our treatments included four rates of nitrogen fertilizer applied as urea post-harvest. 50, 80, 110, and 140 pounds nitrogen per acre. For reference, 80 pounds is the current maximum MSU nitrogen recommendation for established stands. In addition, we also tested two split treatments where a portion of the total nitrogen was applied later during fern growth. These split treatments went on in late July with the goal of promoting fern productivity. But just like with irrigation, it's important not to apply nitrogen too late to avoid stimulating parasitic growth or delaying senescence. To track the effects of our nitrogen treatments, we collected data on stem counts, fern biomass, and fern nutrient content over the course of the summer from shutdown to fern senescence. We also tracked what was happening with soil inorganic nitrogen, both in the top 12 inches during the summer and to one meter depth in the fall. Of course, getting good yield data from a commercial field with picking crews going through sometimes twice a day was a challenge, so we had to get creative. To get information on yield, each week during the harvest season, we would cut and collect the stubble of all spears harvested over the prior week and take them back to the lab, where we'd then count them and use software to measure diameters from imagery. This gave us data on the total number and average diameter of all spears harvested each year which we could then use to evaluate any potential effects the nitrogen treatments may have on yield. We also took one actual harvest of spears each week to evaluate possible effects on spear quality and nitrogen content. So, after three years, what have we found? Well, not many differences. This graph shows total number of spears produced across our end rate and split application treatments over three harvest seasons. We've seen no differences in any year so far, whether we applied 50 to 140 pounds of nitrogen, or whether we applied some end during fern growth or not. The same story was true for the average diameter of spears, which suggests little potential impact of our nitrogen treatments on yield. Interestingly, we've also found very few relevant differences in fern growth characteristics or in fern and spear nitrogen content, despite seeing very effective scavenging of fertilizer end from the soil profile. This suggests the asparagus may just be storing excess N in the root system, and we're in the process of analyzing root samples collected this spring to take a closer look at this. Taken together, we've found very little evidence that higher than currently recommended nitrogen rates or splitting N applications during fern growth are beneficial, or in other words, are likely to provide an economic return. Now, while this is only one relatively short-term study, our results are in good company, with a number of past experiments in Michigan also showing lack of response to higher than recommended nitrogen rates or split applications. It's also worth noting that there's a body of evidence suggesting that particularly higher rates of nitrogen can lead to increased risks of spear quality issues. To understand why established stands of asparagus may not be particularly responsive to more intensive nitrogen management, it helps to look a little deeper. Even accounting for possible variation among cultivars, established asparagus plants have a massive root system for effectively scavenging nutrients and water from the soil profile, and for storing carbohydrates and nutrients that fuel spear growth. And as the root system gets larger with age, its reserves of nitrogen grow as well, with a typical established asparagus root system containing even much more than 280 pounds of nitrogen per acre. This is important because the majority of the nitrogen in spears actually comes directly from the nitrogen stored in the crown, and even high yields require a relatively small proportion of the nitrogen in the gas tank each year. While nitrogen is of course also needed to produce healthy fern in the field, it's still only a portion of potential root storage, 
and up to 90% of that nitrogen in the fern is remobilized back to the root system when the fern senesces. So what's the key take home? The most critical time for nutrient management in asparagus is at establishment when the crown or root system is still small. In that establishment year, MSU nitrogen recommendations are higher, up to 100 pounds of nitrogen, preferably split 50 pounds in the furrow and then another 50 pounds when the fern gets to be about six inches tall. But if for established stands, which were the focus of this study, lower annual nitrogen fertilizer rates are enough. We've seen no evidence that applying more than the MSU recommended 50 to 80 pounds of nitrogen per acre per year or splitting applications during fern growth is likely to provide an economic return. Thanks for listening, and if you're interested, you can hear more about this project at the virtual Great Lakes Expo this year in December. Take care. Hello, I'm Michael Mativa, a master's student in the Hayden Lab. Today I'll be giving an update on a processing carrot trial that we're running in collaboration with Omen Brothers Farms with funding from the Michigan Carrot Committee and the USDA SARE program. This is the second and final year of this trial, which is testing the effects of nitrogen top dress rate and timing on carrot yield and shoot biomass. We've also integrated a remote sensing element in the form of drone imagery. Uh, my thesis is about using drones in vegetable production, and in this trial we're testing the imagery's viability as a decision-making tool for top dress nitrogen applications. I'll be talking a bit more about that aspect later on, but first we'll go over why we ran this experiment. So nitrogen management in processing carrots is trickier than in some other crops. They're typically grown in sandy soils, so applying the entire season's worth of N at planting risks much of it being leached away before the plants can actually use it. Processing carrots can also be in the ground for six months or more, so split top dress applications are often used to ensure a steady supply of nitrogen throughout the season. When to apply those top dresses and how much fertilizer is needed are less certain, and those are the main questions that this experiment is trying to answer. Last year's harvest gave us some interesting insights. You can see a general upward trend in yield as N rate increases, although only the highest N rate showed a significant yield increase from using only starter nitrogen. So far this year, we haven't seen any significant differences in the weight of the carrots based on the N rate. You can see the average fresh weights of the carrots are all increasing similarly over time, but as they grow through September, some treatments might start to run out of gas. Here we have last year's harvest data comparing front-loaded top dressing where we applied all at once in early July versus three split applications about four weeks apart. We actually found no yield differences between the front-loaded and split top dressing strategies, and that same result is developing again this year with the carrots growing at about the same rate. As of August 26th, we still hadn't seen any significant differences between the two strategies. The last yield comparison we made in 2019 was between top dress timings, where we shifted the split application schedule two weeks earlier or later. We saw no significant yield differences, so for our trial it didn't actually matter when top dresses started within that four week window. Once again, this year we're seeing a similar pattern where all the carrots are growing at similar rates, and as of August 26th there were no significant differences in the average carrot weights. It's important to remember that we only pull five carrots per plot every time we visit to monitor their growth, so there's a lot of variability, and as I said, there's still a good amount of time left for differences to show up. We'll have a clearer picture of any differences when we harvest larger sections at the end of the season. The second part of this trial is looking at drone imagery as a tool for top dress decision making. As of now, petiole nitrate testing often fills that role, where a top dress is triggered if the nitrate levels fall below a certain threshold. We sample petioles in this trial every two weeks, but we also fly the drone to monitor the growth and health of the carrots. This could be a faster way to gather data to make top dressing decisions. Flying the drone also allows sampling from the entire field rather than sampling petioles in just a few places. The first step to getting this data is to take images of the field using a drone, in this case a Phantom 4 Pro. These images are brought into this program, Pix4D. Uh, each of these red dots represents one of the images taken by the drone, and you can see that it flew in a grid pattern to get good coverage of the entire field. Pix4D takes all of those overlapping images and matches them up to create one image of the entire field, complete with height and location information for each pixel. This gives us this 3D rendering of the field to analyze. Now we can use geographic software to define where our plots are, like this and extract data about the size and color of the plants in each plot by calculating vegetation indices. For example, this is a common index called NDVI. 
The plants in these lighter, fuller areas are larger and greener on average than those in these darker, more sparse areas. In 2019, we used the NDVI values of the high-end front-loaded treatment to calculate a threshold for top dressing similar to the petiole nitrate threshold. For context, this is the petiole nitrate concentration for the treatment with no top dress N. The concentration quickly falls below the black line, which is the minimum threshold for triggering a top dress, and as it never gets a top dress, it stays low. This is the NDVI tracking for the same treatment with a very similar pattern. It's consistently below the threshold, meaning it should get a top dress, but again, it never does. For comparison, here's the petiole nitrate concentration for the treatment with three top dresses at the recommended end rate. You can see a few spikes after we top dress, but it tends to stay below the line. The NDVI tracking shows the treatment following the recommendation line a little bit better, always staying pretty close and ending up in a good position towards the end of the season. This is just one possible method for using drone imagery similar to how you might use petiole nitrate sampling. We applied on a set schedule for this trial, but in the future it would be interesting to see a trial where the imagery was actually used to decide when to top dress. This trial will be ending with the upcoming carrot harvest, and the data from that harvest will shed more light on how much these different top dress strategies impact yield. That concludes my update on this trial. I hope you found it interesting, and thanks for watching.